We are recording. Thank you. Uh, good evening. It is April 29th, 20, 2024. This is a special meeting of the town council, though to clarify, it's actually a regular meeting, but the only reason we called it as a special is it's the third meeting this week, this month. The open meeting law, a law allows us to continue holding meetings remotely without a quorum of the council physically present at a meeting location while providing the public with adequate alternative access to the meeting. This meeting is accessible in real time by Zoom, by phone, and Amherst Media uh, live stream on YouTube channel. It is not, however, being broadcast by Amherst Media because they are broadcasting the school uh, committee meeting where they're selecting a superintendent. Given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm calling the April 29, 2024 regular our town special town council meeting to order at 6.31. I'll call upon each councilor by name to make sure that they can hear us and we can hear them. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Present. Anna Devlin Gothard. Present. Councilor Ette. Present. Lynn Griesmers, present. Councilor Haneke. Present. Uh, Bob Hegner is absent. Councilor Lord. Present. Pam Rooney. Here. Councilor Ryan. Present. Kathy Shane. I'm here. Andy Steinberg. Present. Jennifer Taub. Present. Alicia Walker is not here yet. Please keep an eye out for Alicia. I'm checking. Okay. Got it. All right. Um, very briefly, uh, we have two regular council meetings scheduled in May, May 6th and May 20th. Um, although the budget will re be released on May 1st, uh, the for first formal presentation of that budget will not be until May 6th. There will also be a public hearing on the FY25 budget at a time yet to be determined. Um, please note that the um, Finance Committee will begin starting on May 3rd. I'm sorry, starting on, yes, on May 3rd. We'll begin meeting at 2 o'clock on Tuesdays and 1 o'clock on Fridays during the month of May. Um, and I also want to mention that Town Services and Outreach uh, Committee will be doing a special meeting uh, for a listening session with regard to Heatherstone Road on Monday, May 13th at 6.30. It will be virtual. Uh, there's two events coming up in the immediate near future and many more in the month of May and June. Uh, we are doing a ribbon cutting at the North Amherst Library on May 2nd and at, at 3.30. And we are doing the Jewish American Heritage Proclamation reading on May 7th at uh, 4.30 at Sweetser Park. Uh, we have no hearing tonight. With that, we're going to move to general public comment. Pardon me, Lynn. We're just having a problem with the YouTube stream. Can we pause for just a moment, please? Thank you. This should just take a minute. Do you want me to start the meeting over again? No, if we could just pause for a moment while they sort that out so that we're live on YouTube. Okay.
For those of you on Zoom, we're paused because we're waiting for the Amherst Media live stream to kick in. Just testing for Amherst Media. Can you hear us? Audio check for Amherst Media. Can you hear us? All right. Thank you for your patient, everyone. Patience, everyone. We're good to go. Thank you. Uh, let me just. Okay, we've already called the meeting to order. Uh, I do want to mention that there is one change in the original agenda as posted, although it has been corrected, and that is, uh, we will not be hearing. Uh, or having a discussion tonight about the acceptance of roads in Amherst Hills as a public way. We hope to postpone, we are postponing that. We hope to bring it back by May 6th. Uh, with that, we're moving to public comment. If you're in the town room and you wish to speak, please make sure you have signed up with Athena. If you are in the audience and wish to speak, please raise your hand at this time. For the Zoom audience. Yeah. Athena, how many people have signed up? We have four in the room. Okay. And at this point, we have three online. Let's begin within the room. Amy Zuba. Let me just start by saying a few things, okay? Um, public comments are a matter within the jurisdiction of the town council. Residents are welcome to express their views for up to three minutes. Uh, the council will not engage in a dialogue or comment on a matter raised during general public comment. Public comments are not reflective of the opinions of the town council. The First Amendment broadly protects individuals' rights to address the government, to speak, and to express themselves, including their right to say hateful and offensive things. I am generally unable to shut those commenters down under the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution unless their level of speech falls within an ex exception articulated by the courts, such as fighting words, true threats to a particular individual, harassment of a particular individual, or incitement of imminent lawless activities. If a question exists as to whether a particular speaker is engaging in unprotected speech, I must defer to the principles of the freedom of speech. We'll recognize speech speakers in the order in which they signed up, rotating between in-person and Zoom. So the first person, Athena. Amy Zuckerman, please come up. You'll have three minutes to make your comment. Please state your name and where you live first, and um, we'll make an announcement that you're recording. Right. Me only. Hi, Amy Zuckerman. 50 years ago, I came to this town to cover the news for the Amherst Record as a 20-year-old. I have something to tell you that's of utmost importance and involves the U.S to the Massachusetts Supreme Court, excuse me, ruling, Commonwealth versus AZ. 
This can be the law of the state right now. I have very important and urgent news for any criminal defendants, or lawyers, criminal defendants, relative or friends of any defendant awaiting trial who's on personal recognizance. On January 25, the Massachusetts Supreme Court, Judicial Court, ruled that under Commonwealth versus AZ, no judge can ever toss a criminal defendant into a Massachusetts psych ward for evaluation to stand trial. This is unconstitutional as of that date. Outpatient evaluation is a new default position that all Massachusetts judges must obey. Only if all if all avenues for outpatient excuse me, if all avenues for outpatient evaluations are exhausted, can a judge toss them into a psych ward involuntarily? And I consider those places worse than prisons because patients are forced to take psych meds no matter how toxic to get released. Who in this town gets arrested and may have to be evaluated to stand trial? I know a few people. There are 30,000 students still so at faculty of UMass, Amherst, Amherst College, about 30,000 of them may get arrested and have to stand trial. Who else can be arrested and be forced into hospitalization? Every one of you who's no longer a minor. Everyone who's no longer a minor. Many of you know me and thought that I was put in prison on a trumped up terrorism charge that I flipped my lid. That was 2018. It was the Norfolk County DA and prosecutors and the Gannett newspapers who cooked up this case and covered up who flipped their lid. These are not newspapers in this town and area. As you likely suspect, I'm the real AZ. I'm the woman who came here 50 years ago in September to learn to be a journalist. I'm the second, I'm also the second Bell of Amherst, the Bell of Amherst, more than that another time. Email me at valleywood2012 if you wanna help me, valleywood2012 at Gmail. Bless me in this town and the Amherst police for keep me going through six horrible years. And thank you to the SJC redeeming my good name. They, the police in Amherst had to arrest me. They did not want to arrest me. They kept me going. People held me. But the Amherst library had, was forced to give me a no press test. Jones, they rescinded it. Amherst Cinema was forced to give me no press pass, but people gave them money, has not rescinded it. I will not be free until the truth is known and I can use my name from sea to shining sea, starting right here in this town. And I'm sorry, I'm hoarse. Thank you for your comments. Yeah, I'm Amy Zuckerberg. Uh, Tony Cunningham, please enter the room, state your name and generally where you live. Hi, uh, Tony Cunningham, District 1. In September 2022, the town council voted eight to five to allow the Jones Library Project to continue until construction bids were received. I understood the urge to give the project every chance and see it through to this point. That was a $2 million bet that construction costs would stabilize and donations to the project would flood in. We now know that bet has not paid off. On Friday, only one bid was received and it's more than $7 million above the most recent estimate. This brings the total project cost for the Jones Library now to a whopping $54.5 million. When the council approved additional borrowing for the project last December, it was with the commitment that the library would repay the town according to a prescribed schedule. One would expect the first installment to be the easiest, but even at this point, three months after it was due, we are still waiting for the library to pay the town $850,000. The library project has received the benefit of the doubt at every hurdle. It has been allowed to go on even when all signs indicated it was no longer viable. As Councillor Steinberg said, back in 2022, if the project doesn't succeed, it won't be for lack of trying. You now have two key points to guide decision-making. The construction bid is many millions above even the stretch budget, and the library was unable to make even its first scheduled payment to the town. I trust that this body will accept reality at this point. As difficult as it may be, it is time to let the ambitious expansion plan go and pivot to plan B. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Back to the room. Maria Kopicki. Thank you, Maria Kopicki, South Amherst. Before this body voted to authorize $46 million of borrowing for the library project last fall, you held a lot of meetings and said a lot of things. You drew up a cash flow analysis, assumed the best case scenario, provided almost no protection for the town if that failed to materialize, and then simply waited for six months. But a lot has been going on since then, none of it good. The construction bid deadline set originally for February 28th has been delayed three times. 
to April 16, then April 23, and then April 26, effectively pushing any potential construction start date out by at least two months. There have been two dozen addenda made to construction documents, several after the subcontractor bids were received, and including multiple sections that were replaced in their entirety. Potential bidders have thus far submitted 100 requests for information about these documents. The Jones Library Building Committee has not met once during all of this, but the lack of public meetings and committee votes to approve invoices didn't stop the town from paying over $300,000 of services during this time, including what appears to be amounts in excess of contracts. Meanwhile, the library has failed to meet its first promised payment to the town, less than $250,000 of the 2 million it said it would pay by January 31st was received on time and nearly $1 million remains in arrears three months later. On Friday, the bid deadline finally arrived and only a single company responded with a construction bid that is more than $7 million higher than what was sought in the bidding documents. This is no longer the $35 million project you authorized borrowing for in 2021. It's not the value engineered $46 million project you authorized borrowing for in December. It is now an approximately $55 million project if it stays within contingencies with no evidence that the promised payments will materialize. It's time to read the writing on the wall. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Ken Rosenthal, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. Thank you. I'm Ken Rosenthal. I live at 53 Sunset Avenue. I want to echo and, and but not repeat the comments you've just heard and give you a little bit of reassurance. You have been told in the past that if you do not continue with the plans for a major renovation of the library, the one that we know, now know the town cannot afford, that the donors who have pledged their contributions to the library will not support anything else. I have had many years of experience in nonprofit management, including the chief executive of an organization that ha had many buildings and was involved in many construction projects. They often came in at prices that initially we could not afford. We would have to make changes, and some of them were radical changes. But I can tell you this about donors. Donors give to an entity that they believe in, the library, not the project specifically, but the library. And when you decide that you're going to make the changes that are necessary to have a renovated rather than reconstructed library, I assure you that you will find those donors willing to contribute too. And when this is a realistic project, one that the town can afford and moves forward on, there will be additional donors also. You've been told by the fundraising arm of the library that donors will not support anything but what they have already seen. That's not so, and I just want to give you that kind of reassurance. I also want to ask again, uh, the council and leadership in town hall to please make the, these meetings available. Please make it possible for us to see who else are attending these meetings on Zoom. I attend many meetings on Zoom with pre-registration that protects them because they know who is being uh, present and who may, might want to speak. Zoom, uh, uh, interference does not usually happen. We can do this in town. I attended a meeting just before this one of the local his, uh, historic district commission and did not realize when I made my first comment that there were 19 other people who were present and willing to speak. I would have altered what I said then just as I would alter what I say now if I knew that there were others who were going to speak after me who might cover the same business. So please take another look at how you can make these meetings that are on Zoom accessible to the public so that we can all see who is in attendance. I assure you, you will not find that inconvenience to yourselves if you do it right. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you for your comments. Back to the room. Vince O'Connor. Vince O'Connor, 175 Summer Street. It's time to pull the plug on the library project. Most importantly, because the project that was bid on, on by one bidder last Friday 
is not the project that was submitted to the voters two, three years ago. And additionally, it is also time to put the, the public works and fire EMT needs where they should have been in the first place. Please do not drag out and put this, put the community through an extended investigation of just how uh, decisions were made and money was spent while the building committee registered no meetings since January. This is the time to put this thing to rest, to make sure, and, and, and I'll say, I worked in the South for two years, um, 1965 to 67. One of the things I learned from both being there and reading about what went on is that when you make difficult decisions after due consideration, you must do them completely. In other words, K through 12 desegregation, not year by year. Do not drag this out. This is not a time for desperate measures, but a time for town, sound decision-making, complete, send it back. Those who don't want to stay on to do um, a, a different project, plan B, uh, welcome their service and go forward. Additionally, I have read in the papers about the fact that somehow the regional school budget will end up in the town manager's budget. I have a copy of the FY22 proposed budget. I looked through it very thoroughly. There is one reference to the Amherst uh, Pelham Regional School District, uh, parenthesized afterwards, assessment. And that reference is one of four under operating budget, town, elementary schools, Amherst, and then Jones Library. I, I, I hope that the manager's budget that's submitted on May 1st will contain a similarly um, simple reference to the Amherst Pelham Regional Schools. The, the amount of the assessments. You need to wrap up. Thank you. Robert Pam, please enter the room, state your name and where you live. You need to unmute, thank you. Okay. I'm Robert Pam, 229 Amity Street. Um, I'm speaking for myself and only myself. The contractor bid for the library is over $6 million higher than the estimates. I believe the town manager will now reject the bid and end this project. I thought that raising the funds for a $46 million project was very challenging, but worth proceeding based upon the results through mid-2023. The costs now, from my perspective, end this project. So I now focus on where this leaves the library. When the town agreed to proceed up to bidding the project, we signed an, agree an amendment to the memorandum of, a, of a agreement, which provides that in the event that the project ends here, the town and library will address the urgent repairs to the building, uh, including but not limited to its roof and HVAC system. The town will proceed with the design construction plan and bidding, and the library will contribute $1.8 million toward the building repairs within three years of the town's decision to stop the larger project. So we must now proceed down a path B. We will have a number of advantages, years of working out how a better HVAC system can function, and preliminary work by town facilities staff, months of library work on clearing out unneeded materials. Work should be possible on a comparatively expeditious and smooth basis. I am speaking with a particular focus. 
As treasurer, I have always concerned myself with library finances. I have just two requests, not to the council, but to those who are listening and those to whom you speak. First, I hope that those who have supported the project will consider allowing the funds to remain with the library to help us cover the upcoming repair costs. Second, those who appreciate the library, whether they have supported the pro project or not, support our annual fund, which finances all of our programs, operations, and uh, materials each year. With or without the expansion project, the library offers critical services to anyone who wants them. Please continue to support our ongoing functions. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there anybody else in the room? That concludes public comment. We're going to move on to the consent agenda. And I just want to remind people that while we may include an item and vote on it on the consent agenda, if you would like to have further discussion about that item, you can do so at the time it appears on the agenda. However, you can also remove an item from the agenda. The following items were selected because they were considered to be routine and it was reasonable to expect they would pass with no controversy. To remove an item from the consent agenda for discussion later in the meeting, ask that it be removed when, the, when I list the consent agenda items. The request to remove an item from the consent agenda does not require a second. So the motion is as follows. To move the following items in the printed motions there under and approve those items as a single unit. 6A, adoption of the Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month Proclamation. 8A, referral, withdrawal of the regional school budget uh, from Finance Committee. 8D, approval of proposed changes to the public way on Belchertown Road. 8E, adoption of surplus property disposition policy. 8F, referral of supplemental appropriation requests for fire engine shortfall to finance committee. Are there any requests for people to have things removed from the consent agenda? Kathy. I'd like to remove the Belchertown Road. Thank you. Are there any other requests? Okay, then I'm seeking a second to the motion as amended by the removal of the public way on Belchertown Road. Second, Dublin Gothier. Thank you. Any further discussion or questions? Seeing none, we'll move to a vote. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hagner is absent, I'm sorry. Uh, Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Alicia Walker is absent. Kathy, she... I'm sorry. Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Councillor Lord. Um, I noticed that um, Councillor Walker is in the attendees. Is she's in the attendees? Thank you for pointing that oh, out. She, she's asked to. She's asked to remain there. Thank you. Um, so the uh, motion passes. Eleven in favor and two absent. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask Pam Rooney, this one of the sponsors of the Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month proclamation, to read the last part. Thank you. The proclamation reads, now therefore, we, the Amherst Town Council, do hereby proclaim the month of May as Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. We urge all residents of Amherst to learn more about the history of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders in our community and nation, and to commit to working toward a more equitable and inclusive Amherst for all. We encourage we further encourage AAPI organizations and all community members to celebrate with us for the fourth annual Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month 
celebration on May 19, 2024, starting at 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. on the Amherst Town Common with a rain location of the Amherst Middle School, 170 Chestnut Street. Thank you. Uh, with that, we're moving to agenda item under actions 8C. The motion is to approve the Amherst College request to place wayfinding signage on the town common at the corner of College Street and Second Ple and South Pleasant Street. Is there a second? Second, Rooney. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask um, Andy Steinberg from the Town Service and Outreach Committee to speak to this motion. Yes, the uh, Town Service and Outreach Committee um, approached this and it's reported in your April 8th meeting uh, TSO committee report and the recommendation this is made after um, substantial discussion has included uh, Department of Public Works and the College uh, members was to make the recommendation. Um, I think the major concern in the last discussion was about the questions of whether the sign would um, interfere with sidelines or otherwise affect safety of traffic. Um, in conclusion, um, supported by uh, all of the information that we received and was reported in that uh, committee report that I referenced, is that the answer is that it will not have impact uh, on, on any of the sidelines that were there. Uh, Basically, we concluded that uh, it, given uh, the relationship, the historic relationship between Amherst College and the town, this was the appropriate um, step to recommend. So that recommendation was made by the committee. Thank you. Councillor Haneke. Thank you. Um, first, I'm going to make a disclosure and then I have some questions. So my husband is employed by Amherst College, but that is in no way affecting my ability to make a decision on this in a um, neutral manner. Um, so I have a couple of questions about the motion itself and the language of the motion that concerns me. Um, the first one is, it appears that the language in the motion does not limit what the sign is, what it looks like, or the size. Is that the case? It just says to place wayfinding signage on the town common at the corner, but it doesn't say anything about meeting X plan or anything like that, and that concerns me. Um, the second question related to the motion is it has no time limit on it. If we pass this motion as is, does this mean that that sign is allowed in perpetuity without ever coming back to the council for any potential extension or anything like that, would we be able to withdraw any sign placement at any point in time with another motion? How legally does that work given the language of this motion? Um, my other question doesn't really relate to the language of the motion, but this is the town common and there are public speech and free speech things we've dealt with with regard to flags and stuff like that if we pass this motion to allow this sign for what could be considered private speech on the town common, does that affect any of our abilities in the future to say yes or no to other requests for permanent signs on the town common with respect to free speech grounds? Good question. Uh, thank you. First of all, uh, let me go back to, I, we, we certainly can amend the motion. Um, and we can do that tonight or we can bring it back. Uh, are there uh, either Paul or Andy or um, Andy, Paul or Athena, do you want to speak to that? Any of those questions? Well, the, the council could certainly put time restrictions on it in terms of how long you want to have the authorization last. It can be forever or you can say within 
a week, a day, a, a year, a decade, whatever you choose. Um, it would be that's a it's a this is a discretionary action by the town council. Um, in terms of the free speech, I don't know the answer to that question. We, um, if that if this puts us in peril for anything else, but free speech is free speech on the town common. It doesn't. But I think what your question is is, would a another entity be for, but would the council be discriminating if another entity said I'd like to put a permanent sign on the council, um, on, on the town common? Um, I think you it's a purely discretionary action by the by the council, but I do not know the legal analysis of that. I this question came up and I spoke with Dave about okay. it. And I think what you're referring to is equal access. Yeah. Um, and my understanding from that conversation was that there's a precedent with our relationship with Amherst College. And so that that would have set this situation apart from anybody asking for a similar situation. Is there a way that you would like to amend the motion, Mandy Jo? I, I also had a question about the limits to the type of sign given the motion just says wayfinding signage. Mm -hmm. We can I can I can add language that references the schematic that we received from Amherst College. So the the size I can put this up. We can add the size of the sign listed here. Okay. Does that document have a title? <laughs> Because I, I can make the motion to amend. I just need a title of the that, document. I, I totally hear you. Amherst Wayfinding Request for Permanent Use of Public Way dated January 5, 2024. So if it's acceptable to you, I would just add, as shown in the, in the document titled Amherst Wayfinding Request for Permanent Use of Public Way dated January 5, 2024. Is that acceptable? I, I would like to make a motion. OK. Um, and I would like that motion to be up on the screen with, yeah. with, with the additions to it. Yes. So I guess my motion would be to amend, to add the phrase um, in accordance with the schematic in the document titled Amherst Wayfinding and whatever Athena just said, <laughs> um, and for 20 years. Okay. Um, Athena, do you want to put the motions up and show the amendment? And I'll seek a second. I'll second that. Dublin got there. Is there a second? I, I, Anna, seconded. Thank you. So while we're doing that, um, unless you object, me and uh, Councillor Haneke, I'm going to go on to Anna Devlin Goth here. Anna? A uh, quick one. I also have a disclosure. I am employed by Amherst College, but that does not cloud my judgment, nor my ability to be impartial in this uh, decision. Is there anything else? Nope. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Ryan. So I don't know if anybody was downtown today, but um, the Amherst College bookstore always opened. And uh, I just would like you all to be aware of that. I think it reflects the fact that uh, the college is conscious of its relationship with the town. Um, they didn't have to put the bookstore there. Um, in time for graduation, in time for reunions, um, everyone who wants any merch uh, related to Amherst College will need to come uh, to that store. And at the same time, we'll be then uh, hopefully drawn to our shops and restaurants and to hopefully soon our newly um, recreated South Common. Um, the college has a long and storied history, and its relationship to this town is a very deep one. I think it's very clear that they see it as an important relationship. We're currently in negotiation with the college um, for a more permanent, lasting relationship with uh, substantial financial implications. I think this has been going on long enough. I think it's the time for us to make a gesture to the college, and this sign, I think, reflects the deep connection between the college and the community. Um, I don't have any particular objection to the amendment. Uh, 20 years seems arbitrary to me, but maybe somebody can explain to me why that's a magic number. Um, I agree that we should reference the dimensions, et cetera, of the sign. So I have no doubt that the sign will be exactly as it was referenced earlier. That seems like an appropriate thing to do. But I hope we will take the high road and make a gesture to the college, which has now been after our permission for a very, very long time. And I think it's time for us simply to act. Okay. 
Um, so the motion that is on the floor or the amendment, excuse me, to the motion that is on the floor means that the uh, motion in total, well, the amendment is to amend the motion by adding at the end, if you will, in accordance with the schematic in the document titled Amherst Wayfinding Request for Permanent Use of Public Way dated January 5th, 2024, and by adding an expiration date uh, of the authorization for 20 years from today's date, which is 429 20, 2044. The motion, the amendment's been made and seconded. Are there any other questions about the amendment to the motion? George? So can someone explain to me what expiration date means? Does that mean the sign will be dismantled? Does that mean that the college has to come back to us and uh, request that the sign continue to be there? Um, does this uh, amendment make that clear? I'd just like somebody to explain what, uh, for, for my sake, let alone for the sake of the college, what uh, a 20-year expiration date actually means. Uh Mandy, uh, Councillor Haneke, would you like to add your interpretation of that? Sure. My intention is that they either come back to the council to seek an extension of that time period or it gets dismantled. And at that time, we have the opportunity to say, gee, the sign doesn't look very good. Can you please refresh it or something like that? Or they could change the style 20 years from now. Right. Okay. Uh, Anna. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think this kind of is protecting both entities in a way. Um, and I guess I see it that way. I don't know if everyone else sees it that way, but I do see this as something that's saying this is not a, this sign for forever. Um, it is saying in 20 years, our needs might have changed. Uh, the town's use plan for that common might change. I, and the college's needs for its signage might change. I think this is just saying that we don't want something to be, no pun intended, but set in stone in perpetuity um, and that we want to have the um, sort of set requirement out there that it will be revisited and easily reauthorized. Um, that's kind of the baseline forward. If changes need to be made, great, but otherwise, and 20 years is a long time. Okay. Um. Are there any other comments, Kathy? Uh, just a quick one. Um, if you try to add all the words uh, Athena wrote up there, it doesn't quite read right. So I'm assuming that the motion will, you can't say and by adding, you know, so uh, it, the motion would say, and this authorization shall ex be for 20 years. Is, is, is that the words that would be added? I just am looking for what, what it is we're voting on. The wording. Athena's working on that. Yep. And then put it back up on the screen. So while we're waiting on that, we'll vote first on the amendment and then on the motion itself. Okay, so if you'll just highlight the amendment. There's two parts to this amendment. Okay, are there any further questions or comments on the amendment? Okay, then we're going to move to uh, approve or move to vote on the amendment as you see it up here in yellow. I'm going to start with Councillor Ette. 
Yes. Lynn Griesmer is aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner is absent. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Councillor Walker is in the audience. Uh, Pat DeAngelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. The motion, the amendment to the motion passes 11 in favor to absent. We'll now move to the original motion, which now includes the amendment and is on the screen. Any questions? Thank you. Then we'll move. Uh, Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner's absent. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Todd. Yes. Councillor Walker in the audience. Pat DeAngelis. Present. I mean, um, I <laughs> thank you, Pat. Um, <laughs> present and voting aye. Thank you. Uh, Anna Devlin Gothia. Aye. And Councillor Ette. Aye. The motion is approved 11 in favor, two absent. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to move on to Belchertown Road. And uh, it's to, I'm going to make the motion to approve the permit changes to the public way on Belchertown Road as shown on the construction plan titled Belchertown Road in parens Route 9, RT9, Improvements STA 2 plus 72 to STA 11 plus 43, uh, dated March 2024. Is there a second to the motion? Steinberg seconds. Okay. Uh, this was also reviewed by TSO. Andy, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes, um, I hope that everybody had a chance to look at our supplemental, our, our report that was submitted with today's date um, to the committee, from the committee to the council. Um, we uh, had dealt with this in two separate meetings because in the first meeting, um, after a presentation um, from the town manager and superintendent of public works we determined that it would be helpful to ask the transportation advisory committee and the um, disability access advisory committee to uh, render opinions about um, the proposal and um, both reported back um, as far as the actual proposal with um, strong support um, including making sure that the rectangular flashing beacons that were specified in the proposal are included because of the safety um, of using a crosswalk on that busier road. There, there were other issues that came up um, about Belchertown Road that extended beyond the um, area that was covered by the grant. Uh, we heard those, uh, we did report on them, but we recognize that they are not actually a part of the proposal that was being made and is before the council tonight and in the motion that was just made and put on the floor. So um, with that, I um, will, uh, I, I think, conclude the report any other members of the committee have uh, anything they would like to add, they certainly can uh, do so. The very detailed and small print schematic is on the screen. Um, Kathy, you asked that this be removed from consent. Would yes, like I, I did for a couple of reasons. One, I had a question on does the grant pay for what we're seeing? I have absolutely no problem with crosswalks with flashing beacons. I think speed in this area is a major concern and doing these small segments where it's pointed out this kind of ends, um, you have a bike lane going along a very busy road and then it comes to an end. 
This is right by where the school is. And I have been hoping for a while that we would have a big plan. Like, what are we going to do about the intersection? We've got this cross where the bank sits so that cars can scoot in there. Um, they don't always stop. They use it as a cutoff. Um, and, and so I, I felt like this was somewhat incomplete, incomplete in dealing with a series of issues. And if this is all grant money and this is all we could afford right now, as far as I know, it's part of a larger plan, but it feels to me like it's um, a small piece that's not necessarily connected to what happens a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. I think this is, you know, when we um, uh, talked about building the new ho housing there and bought the land, we all remarked on how dangerous the intersection was and both for bikes, for pedestrians, for the way cars go through. So um, I have no doubt that we need to do work on it. So that was my concern. I mean, and there was a mention in the TAC report on the speed. I mean, it's, it boggles my mind that it could ever be 40 miles here, but why not 25? I mean, this is such a congested area. So I, I'm not sure why we're not doing all the pieces together. And that was why I pulled it, because I wanted to render concerned about small pieces that aren't necessarily connected. And I know this is costly, so I'm not saying that we have the money to do a lot more. I just like to have a bigger picture of what we're gonna do. Um, Paul Bockelman, would you like to speak to this? I also note that Guilford Maureen is with us tonight. Yeah, Guilford may want to weigh in as well. But first I wanna commend our DPW and planning department for getting this grant in the first place. It's $755,000. Uh, without that grant, we would be doing none of this work. So when we look for grants from the state, which is what we need to do because it, they always come with strings. We have to identify locations that are, are attractive to the funding uh, decide, decision makers. This one was, had a lot of assets for it uh, because it was associated with our affordable housing project near a village center, high pedestrian area, near a new school. All these things helped us um, achieve the grant for it. We would love to do everything that you're asking for, um, Kathy, uh, but the money isn't there. And so I think when DPW does the, they create these plans, it's not done in a vacuum. They look at the larger project um, and Guilford can talk about that as well. Guilford, did you wanna to speak to this? Uh, yes, so the, the, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Sorry, I froze on my screen, I was one. Um, so the larger project actually went from Southeast Street to the town line on Belchertown Road. That project has been in the works for maybe 10 years, and we've been slowly been working on that project. Um, the school came up, and when the school came up and people were concerned about the intersections on Southeast Street and on um, Main Street, those intersections were pulled out, and that's now its own separate project, and this project was actually shortened a little bit. Then the grant came up for the project that would support the housing we're putting in, and we broke the project even smaller and we made the piece that goes from the split in the intersection or split in Belchertown Road to just past Colonial Village. Uh, there is a third piece of the project, a third split, which is from Colonial Village out to Stanley Street. And that will probably come forward as a community development block grant project next year, or it's this year's for, it's in this year's recommendations for next year. So from, the split by Cumberland Farms to Stanley Street, that project is going to be a complete project within a year and a half to two years. And then the intersection projects will be intersection projects on their own. Um, and that work is proceeding. It's uh, it's taking a little more time and a little more money than we thought because it's, as you imagine, it's a lot, a lot, of, it's a lot more complicated. That's the word I'm looking for. I apologize. Andy, you have a question? It, it's not really a question. Um, I was going to um, supplement the TSO report in response to some of the very good questions that uh, Kathy has uh, raised. Um, one is that um, we did have um, questions of uh, Superintendent Mooring regarding the point where 
the lane, uh, the bike lane will end and what kind of signage will be there. And there was, uh, 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 he can probably respond to it better than, than I, but uh, he did report on signage uh, plans for um, safely marking uh, according to uh, what he thought were reasonable standards and we accepted his uh, representation for those uh, uh, critical points where the bike lanes end. The other thing that I uh, thought mentioning is that um, I really appreciated the comments of the Disability Access Advisory Committee. And uh, I encourage uh, all counselors uh, next time to drive that section, particularly to look at the sidewalk from Gatehouse Road going uh, back towards town to the uh, main part of town to the west and uh, look at how uh, narrow the sidewalk is and um, the, how close it is to the, that it is really immediately abutting the road. And in some sections, not really with any significant curbing. And uh, there was um, concern expressed by DAAC regarding that safety and uh, our, our lack thereof and uh, so we uh, we appreciated those comments, but as I previously noted, um, we uh, hoped that uh, they were heard by uh, DPW, but uh, they were not part of the proposal uh, because it was not the section that we were talking about. Thank you. Also note that the Transportation Advisory Committee took a the opportunity to provide a lengthy analysis and suggestion for this area. Kathy? I, I thank um, Guilford and Paul for the responses that there is an emerging bigger picture. Um, and I guess my request would be at some point over not any particular time, trying to have that talked through with um, whether it's the school, I agree about the narrowness of the sidewalk. We have a, it, up in North Amherst, we have a disappearing bike lane. And what's interesting about it is no one even knows there is one. And then it says it ends <laughs> because there is so little room for the bikes and it's so dangerous that you go, oh, it just ended. But I, every, so what, what everyone does is they ride on the sidewalk because it, it's, it conflicts with it. Things. So just some sense, I mean, Guilford gave it in verbally, and I was glad to hear that in east and west directions and north and south, there's uh, trying to think through the pieces. So I didn't object to what I was seeing on the paper. I just felt like it was missing pieces, including the speed of the road and the width of the sidewalks. The larger picture in this case is Belgertown Road, northeast, southeast, the intersection, and the side streets that all of that is what you're talking about. Kathy. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay. Because it, that's the whole the whole piece of it is what makes it um, scary right now and scary all the time. Not right. just and then if you put more apartments in there and you want people to be walking or right. riding their bikes, um, uh, making it possible. So. Paul, I absolutely think it's wonderful. Get another seven hundred thousand. Get another million. You know, we we clearly need financial help to do what we need to do here. Um, thank, thank you, you. Councilor Ryan. Just pointing out that uh, at least at the moment, the current plan is to take five hundred thousand dollars out of uh, uh, the fund for road work for the coming fiscal year. Is there anything else on this before we bring it to a vote? Motion's been made and seconded. We'll begin the uh, vote with Councillor Haneke. Aye. Bob Hegner's absent. Councillor Lord. Aye. Pam Rooney. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. 
Councillor Walker is absent. Patty Angelis. Aye. Anna Devlin Gothia. Aye. Councillor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. The, it's, it's unanimous with 11 in favor and two absent. Um, and thank you. Thank you, uh, Guilford. Thank you. And again, echoing Paul's, thank you for um, getting this grant and continuing to look for opportunities for more. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah. The next item is the proposed amendment to town council rules of procedure. The, the motion is to refer the proposed, the following proposed amendment to the town council rules of procedure to the governance organization and legislation committee for a report to the town council by June 24, 2024. And it is to amend the town council, town council rules of procedure, rule 20, rule 2.2, powers of the president and vice president by adding uh, Roman numeral I, or I, yes, I'm sorry, it's not Roman numeral. The president shall be an ex officio non-voting member of all committees after H, and by adding, this shall include participation ex officio as a non-voting member a committee where the vice president is not appointed as a voting member after the sentence, the vice president shall preside in the absence of the president. The motion, it, this is a motion has been made. Is there a second? Shane will second since I proposed this. Okay, Kathy, would you like to speak to your motion? Uh, yes, um, this, uh, the concept of ex officio came up actually way back in 2018 when we were writing the rules of procedure and we discovered that several towns enabled their president and I now added, or the vice president to be an ex officio non-voting member. And my understanding of why that was done and then I've seen over the last five or six years, it avoids a situation where the president who appoints all of us to committees um, and wants to serve on a committee, appoints his or him herself, the president, in um, preference over other council members because there are only five slots. If you remove that conflict, the president can, if they have the time and they wanna follow a particular committee, um, continue to participate in it. So I thought it was um, wouldn't be used very often, but I thought it enables um, the situation we had this year, which was very different than year one. Uh, our president had to beg people to go on the finance committee. She had to twist arms to get up to five. This last time we had well more than five people wanting to be on the finance committee and by the president pulling herself, herself off it, it created space for others to come on. But um, I realized that everyone, all of us have the right and we can participate in the public um, and we can give a three minute set of comments, but it's not the same as sitting at the table. So I thought it was a useful device and I was overruled way back when on including it. And so I don't think it's critical you know, in, when we were first writing our rules, we looked at several towns had it, and I actually thought we had written it in it at one point, but we, we never did. So that's why I'm proposing this as a potential way for the president to participate and or the vice president to participate without having to be one of the appointed people on the committee. Okay, Jennifer? Does this mean that the president and or vice president would not serve on any committee? It doesn't preclude them serving on a committee. Um, you know, you if we wrote it stronger that said they wouldn't serve on the committees, we would take away their, they are counselors and they could always put in their name to be serving on a committee. So I think what it does in other towns is the president has a lot of things to do. They don't necessarily serve on a committee, but if there's a committee and a set of discussions going on for those time periods, they can be come in the way our non-voting residents do on the finance committee. So it removes, I think it makes the president's job somewhat easier because they don't have to be on committees. We have 
a lot of members on all our committees. If we had fewer, we probably wouldn't even need this. But, but, but that's right, Jennifer. It doesn't say that the president couldn't just appoint themselves to a committee. So the initial rationale um, you expressed was that it would preclude a situation where a president might appoint themselves in place of another counselor. But you're saying that will still happen because they can. Like well, one... you wouldn't need to because you could still be fully participating. Unlike um, if I go to a CRC meeting as a non-member, I have to sit in the audience and I get my I can talk for three minutes, but I can't really sit at the table and talk back and forth the way you can if you're um, so the, the president could choose not to appoint themselves, knowing that at the time periods, they may not want to attend every meeting of a particular, they don't have to say, I'm going to be the ex officio and be at every meeting, but they might want to engage. So it opens up another route for the president to participate without having to appoint themselves. So yes, it's it's for those conflicts. We We haven't had that many times where there are more people who want to be on a committee than, um, but there have been, and the president also wants to be on that committee. So we haven't had that many situations, but this would attenuate that, it would moderate it. So it's really more so the president, whoever that you know person is, could sit at the table as a non-voting member of any committee, but it's really not because we want and I'm not saying I don't haven't observed it being a conflict of interest, but that it's really not so much so the council, so the president is not appointing himself over someone else to serve on a committee. That that's right. Yeah, but you know, I I think you know one of the things we talked about if people don't like this idea at all, I don't think we need to send it to GOL. You know, so it's, it doesn't have to be an automatic referral, I thought um, it was a tool that other towns have given themselves that helps the president not be in a conflict on a, I would really like to be on this committee. However, there are six people who want to be on it already. And I, if they point themselves, then someone doesn't get the slot because you can serve in a non-voting way and participate. I mean, you always get a vote, but the committee, our committees don't make the decision the decision comes back to the council. So the actual vote that counts is when the council's voting. I mean, we we don't, we don't could have four-person committees and have two, two votes because we don't need to have a majority vote to get it out of committee I mean, because it's the council. So that's where this came from. Councilor Haneke. I don't, now that Councillor Shane Cathy has explained some of it to me, the rationale seemed conflicting. I was not really in favor of this to begin with, but it's always been talked about as, well, you don't have to, to do it so that the president can always just show up and they won't appoint themselves. But if you're not a prohibiting them from appointing themselves, they'll still appoint themselves <laughs> to the committee they want. And I actually do believe they have that right and that we cannot stop that right under the charter that says the president shall appoint members of all committees of the town council. I don't think we can abridge that right, which means I don't believe we should be able to stop that right. And so one of my concerns was, does it the exact question that Jennifer asked, could are you trying to prohibit the president from appointing themselves but if you're not prohibiting that i'm not sure i see the need for this thing at all um and i also i i not only don't see the need for it because you can always just watch a committee meeting i actually worry that it gives the president more rights than other counselors um, because it would allow the president or if the president chooses not to go to a committee, the vice president to come to any meeting and any committee meeting and 
put their say in when other counselor at any time, because they're quote at the table, when other counselors do not have that right. Um, and the charter does say that the president has the same powers to vote upon measures coming before the council as any other member. So I don't think we can take away the president's ability to vote in committee. I think we have to allow them the opportunity to appoint themselves. But I also don't think it's right to say the president can show up to any committee and sit at the table, but hey, you counselor from district one can't. I don't, I, I don't think that's right either. Uh, the president under the charter has the right to oversee, but oversee is different from putting their opinion in every committee because they want to. So I'm, I'm not seeing the need for this. I'm not seeing the necessity of this. And I actually see a lot of drawbacks for it. So I'm not even sure I'll vote to refer it. Okay, Pat. Thank you. Uh, Mandy has said some of the things I wanted to say. I totally oppose this. Um, it gives the president and the vice president power that none of the rest of us have. And one of the things that is important to me is that there be an equality um, of action. It, um, this is that why should the president or vice president be able to do something on a committee that I can't do? I attend meetings that I'm interested in. If there's a committee that I wanted to be on and I didn't make it, I follow that committee. I can use public comment, but I don't think that I should or any counselor, including the president or vice president, be able to talk anytime they feel like it as a full member of the committee. It is, um, it bends the power structure, I think, in a really negative way. The other thing is, and there might, I'm not firing on all cylinders because I've been sick for a while, but when I read this, it's supposed to be saving the president time. Um, but it, if you go into it, it says, it would also protect the president's time because participation in each committee would not be optional. If it's not optional, you have to attend. Isn't, am I misinterpreting that? And if we're trying to save the president time and make them special in a way that no one else on the council is, why is it, why isn't it optional that they can go or not go? And shoving the vice president, and I have respect for these two women, so this is not about them. <laughs> shoving the vice president in when the president doesn't want to go, it's just, it it's creating a problem that doesn't exist right now, and we don't need, and I spoke too long, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Pam Rooney. Thank you. Um, my thoughts were that if the president doesn't sit on any committee um, from the beginning of the term, that's different. I might, I might be somewhat okay with an ex officio role for that person if they don't sit on any committee. Um, I also thought that um, an opportunity if if they were to serve as ex officio, that they only would do it when there was a lack of quorum for any particular committee. And that's that's pretty rare. I mean, we can function with three out of five. So I don't know that too many meetings have actually been canceled because of lack of quorum, but that was my other consideration. Um, I would have to agree with the preceding um, speakers that for someone who manages the agenda, participates in wording of motions, and manages the discussion on the floor, I would, I really don't think that person ought to have additional power to participate as an ex officio member in, in all of the committees. Um, it is, has been said, I think it's, it's a little too much and I wouldn't be able to support that. Andy. So I've actually, uh kind of a question concern and I just wanted to bring it forward to the council and if the vote tonight is to refer to um, GOL to investigate that they do, um, at least are cognizant of this particular question. Question is, if you have five members of a committee and then um, the president of the council is a sixth member ex, ex officio, um, one more person 
um, attending the meeting because of their uh, involvement in whatever um, action is before the committee um, almost assures that you have a majority of the council present. And does that mean that we're gonna end up with more committee meetings uh, being uh, posted as special council meetings and uh, how is that process gonna work? So that's the issue that I would like to make sure the GOL considers if it gets the referral tonight of this particular request. Uh, Councillor Ette. So there's what is conceived in theory and what works in practice. And I'm wondering, even do we have what is written in the text from some of these towns, has it solved the problem that we imagine that it's solving? So um, besides the fact that it's in the text, what do these towns say about this particular part as solving the problem of time for the president? Um, I would like to say that I personally feel no need for this. Um, I have not been on the finance committee this year. Those of you that are on the finance committee note that I often attend. I sit in the audience every once in a while. I get, you know, I'd like to say something, but I haven't felt like I had to say it. Uh, and, um, I, I, think that the concerns that people have expressed, and I really appreciate this conversation because I think it's important for people to state their concerns. Uh, I think that, that, you know, giving the president and the vice president this additional um, right to go to a committee and express their opinion actually creates an unequal balance in the council. And so I don't think we want to do that for this president or any other president. Uh, so I understand the rationale. I appreciate Councillor uh, Kathy Shane bringing this forward, um, but I personally don't see the need for it. So. Kathy? Hearing what I think are terrific reasons why this isn't a good idea, I can just withdraw it, okay. and I would be happy with it. I'm at... I, uh, what, what uh, Freca, uh, Councillor Ette raised is I don't know the answer to that, how, is, how it has worked in other towns. I just saw several had included it. And I think it was, um, and my experience in the first few years of, I will say that not getting on committees or trying to get on committees and seeing that the president could appoint themselves, um, this looked like a way out but I'm fine with drawing this. And I think it's been great, Lynn, that you've actually sat in the audience on the finance committee. <laughs> you know, I mean, in, in terms of, um, it, it's helpful to have people be following the discussions. Mm -hmm. So I will just, I don't think this needs to go to GOL given the general sen sentiment that it's not a good idea. Okay. Uh, the person that has proposed this has withdrawn the motion. I made the original motion. Kathy, you seconded it. I'm fine with withdrawing it. Are there any further discussions? Fine. Then we will move on to appointments. We're going to begin. I'm going to call on the town manager. This is the appointment with regard to Gabe Ting as police chief. Paul, would you like to speak to this? Do you want to begin with a motion? Thank you. Uh, to approve the town manager's appointment of Gabriel Ting as chief of police. Is there a second? Second, Devlin Gothier. Thank you. Paul. Thank you. Um, I am super proud to um, appoint Gabe Ting and ask for your confirmation of this appointment tonight. Um, Gabe Ting is, is police chief. Uh, Gabe Ting has been with the force for 27 years. Um, and as I uh, discussed at the TSO committee meeting. He has the education training work experience um, that is required to be the chief of police and be a very successful one. His life story really reflects many experiences that we have in our town. 
he is an immigrant. He is a, 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 with his parents are Chinese and he's of Chinese descent. He went through the town's K to 12 schools. He attended UMass and went to graduate school at Western New England University. And he's been on the police department, police force and has raised, uh, come up through the ranks. Um, he, he was a union president for a time, which helps us when we're on the other side of the table um, and has been very instrumental in supporting the implementation of the Crest Department and supporting the, the dispatchers as well. Um, he has done every job in the police department. So and when it comes to day-to-day -day management, he brings the, uh, he's a known entity and he knows how all those jobs are, are um, uh, need to be done. He's ready, willing, and able to step up to become the police chief. And I just want to recognize that um, we've had a history of really strong chiefs of police in this town. Um, uh, most recently, Scott Livingstone. Um, it's not an easy job. It, and the, the, Gabe will learn a lot as he does the job. You don't walk into that job. Any, no one can walk into that job knowing everything that needs to be known. But what I liked about Gabe, and I was able to work with him on a temporary basis for, for quite some time during the last year, is that he is not just a good listener, he's eager to listen and to learn. Um, he, he is really, his big emphasis has, it will be to work with youth and to be better, having better connections with the youth in our community. And um, the, even this morning, we were talking about different ways that the police department can be better at engaging with the community. Um, you know, the, we've had a lot of discussions about police work in our town, and we're taking um, positive mo uh, ways of addressing it from everything from the Crest Department to have unarmed response to certain types of calls uh, to a resident oversight board, which um, Gabe fully supports. Um, and I think that, um, that his leadership and his ability to listen are two of the hallmarks for um, what will make him a terrific police chief. So I ask for your support on him becoming the next chief of police for the town of Amherst. We have our HR director who was very involved in this search. Melissa, do you have any comments you'd like to make at this time? I would just say that it was a very involved um, and thorough search. Uh, we posted this in November and the search committee was um, comprised of nine community members, very strong. They uh, took their time and deliberated. And uh, I think we came out with a very strong finalist. And I echo uh, Paul's confidence in um, in uh, Gabe Ting's ability to, to, to do, excuse me, to do the job. And Thank if, you. If I could just add, I do want to specifically call out the um, police chief search committee. Um, it was really a terrific group. They really liked each other and enjoyed being together. Um, and they've, each of them told me that and includes uh, the chair was Everett Henry, who is a member of the Community Safety and Social Justice Committee. Uh, Len Bez Ben Ezra, who's executive director, director of the Amherst Survival Center. Tony Butterfield, he's the chair of the Amherst Personnel Board and professor emeritus at the Eisenberg School of, of Management at the university. Liz Haygood, who is the co-chair of the Human Rights Commission. Uh, Jen Weiston, the assistant director for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Tim Nelson, the fire chief. Tyrone Parham, a police chief at the University of Massachusetts, and many people found his professional expertise and insights were very important. Uh, Derek Shea, principal of Crocker Farm Elementary School. David Williams, who was a member of the Amherst Housing Authority and also a member of the Amherst League of Women Voters Racial Justice Committee. And then, and then Melissa really did the, a lot of the work in bringing this to conclusion. So thank you, Melissa. Thank you. Andy, this came to TSO. Did you wanna to speak to that, please? Very briefly, because the report that we submitted to the council of last Thursday's meeting uh, uh, speaks for itself. Uh, we uh, came to the conclusion after discussion and the vote that was reported that uh, this was the, an appropriate um, and thoughtful appointment, and we were um, also very impressed by the process that led to the identification of two people um, that were then thoroughly uh, uh, interviewed and had um, substantial exposure in many places within town in very public way and invited comment. So um, 
felt as a matter uh, of the process and the conclusion. That was uh, the basis in this uh, note, though it was a vote of three yes, um, one abstention and one member absent. Thank you. Are there any comments or questions? Seeing none, I'm going to move to the vote. We begin with Councilor Lord. Nay. Pam Rooney? Yes. Councilor Ryan? Aye. Kathy Shane? Yes. Andy Steinberg? Aye. Jennifer Todd? Yes. Uh, Pat DeAngelis? Aye. Anna Devlin Gothier? Aye. Councilor Ette? Aye. Lynn Griesmer is an aye. Councilor Haneke? Aye. That's uh, 10 in favor, one opposed, and two absent. Uh, we are going to uh, move on to committee and liaison reports. We're going to start with the Community Resources Committee. Uh, Pam Rooney. Thank you. Uh, and this report should have gotten into the packet, but I don't think it did. Um, we have been working with uh, Planning Director Christine Brestrup as we start to parse apart the solar bylaw. She came with some uh, suggestions from a meeting that she held with Mandy Johanneke to, to discuss how the draft, in fact, might be handled. And the suggestion at this point is to perhaps um, break it into some pieces that might uh, not all look like bylaws. Some might be rules and regulations. Anyway, we'll be back to you with that as we start to pull it apart. Um, we also were very pleased that last meeting or last council meeting, we had the ZBA members approved. We are now currently um, starting the process for planning board uh, vacancies. Thank you. Okay. Um, Pat DeAngelis, you've uh, indicated you would like to leave and I yeah. just make, make note of that in the minutes, okay? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, are there any questions or comments with regard to CRC or any other members of the committee? Okay, go on to the elementary school building committee, Kathy Shane. Uh, we met last Friday and what it, the, we're, we're at a point where there are fairly detailed designs in terms of co including color and some of the, the you who saw the early presentations, they're in video form as you walk around the hallways and you walk up and down the stairs. So I'm trying to figure out how to, the files are too big for us to post them, to create them into snapshots. But the 90% um, estimates, all the details have been sent on to the cost estimators. And at this point, we're very close to the equivalent of blueprints for the school. And so there are voluminous drawings as well as specifications that will be reviewed by the MSBA. There's a commissioning agent that will be reviewing them. Our OPM and an unassociated architect will be reviewing them. And town staff is reviewing them. So they're multipleized. It's not just a cost estimate. And we'll have those revisions by the May meeting. Um, so that's where we are there. Um, if you haven't been over to Fort River, they're starting to move and level the dirt. So it's 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 starting to look like a real beginning rather than just us with our little hats and shovels on <laughs> digging a little dirt. So it's it's quite exciting. Are there any questions? Uh, Kathy, I'm going to ask you to step in on the finance committee since Bob is not here. Yes. and. Uh, Athena, I just need to double check that the Friday meeting's not posted yet, but we're finance is meeting, just say the time that we're meeting. Friday at 10, I believe, and Tuesdays at 2. Right, and because I think when Lynn first said it, she said 1 o'clock. I might have misheard you because in my calendar it's 10. So we will be... It's Friday at 10. Yeah, we're... we're uh, as of Friday, we will be talking. Uh, there will be a schedule on which departments we're meeting with. And at that point, we will also have the town manager's proposed budget. So we will beginning be start to begin the review of the budget with a schedule. 
we don't have the schedule yet, but we will have it very soon. And those are the twice a week meetings. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Pam? Yes, I have a question. Um, will the discussion with the town manager as you start with the with the proposed budget have several options of 4%, 6% uh, as requested by the school committee? Um, I, I wonder, I'm just asking if I'm, there's going to be a range. I'm going to let presented. Paul answer it because right now um, the the rest of the budget is dealing with the guidelines. So the regional school is going to come in in a different way. And I, as of the last meeting, we didn't have a concrete proposal from them. So I'm assuming we're going to have a proposal. Yeah, so I would just w want to make sure that we understand what the ramifications are for choices. Okay. Paul? So, so the school committee did vote a budget on when, last Wednesday. Uh, we have that vote that they took. Um, that will their action will be incorporated into the budget in terms of information for the council. This has happened in prior years where a school committee had voted at a different number than was um, presented by the town manager. So you'll see both of those numbers uh, in the budget and you, so as part of your deliberation process. Um, Paul, do you know whether we're going to get a detailed budget at some point? Um, it, there is the original budget that was the January budget with line items. Uh, did you have an idea of whether uh, I have, it, I what, have, what we're going to be yeah. able to see? Yeah. I have their action. We, we certainly, you certainly should have the actual budget itself. I mean, ultimately the council only votes the bottom line of their budget. They get to allocate the funds as they see fit. Um, but yes, we will certainly request that for you before you start your deliberations. Because that was some of the questions that finance had proposed is if it's something less than the original what is it buying? You know, if we go up beyond the four percent that was in the original guidelines, what do we get? I, that, it's not that's a little crude way to to state it, but you know, wh what what changes do not have to happen, and what's the glide path going forward? Okay. So, so Pam, that's the best I can do to answer it because we're 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 waiting for some of the documents. Okay. Um, I, I just I do want to mention to everyone, it's not a we not for discussion, but in your packet tonight, JCPC did finish its work and sent the report to Paul. We we are a referral to Paul, and I did a very short summary of some of the main things. So to the extent people want to see the capital budget deliberation, but he as the manager still has to put together the capital budget. So we had recommendations in it, um, but it's a tougher each year is going to be tougher as we go forward because we're starting to see big buildings come online. Thank you. Uh, GOL, Anna, and uh, Councilor Frecke, I mean, Essay. So I, we've had one GOL meeting uh, since our last town council meeting. I was not there. My, Frecke, uh, do you want me to go for it or do you want to take it? All right. Okay. So my understanding is that at that meeting, the GOL committee uh, approved the AAPI Heritage Month proclamation and engaged in discussion regarding the two committee appointment recommendations that GOL has to make. Um, I do not believe that votes were taken on those items. However, to this point, we have determined the pool for the Charter Review uh, Commission to be sufficient. And I want to extra appreciate folks who have continued to submit CAFs after the fact. Um, they're not in this room, obviously, but thank you. Um, Councilor Ete, did I miss anything that you all discussed? We've also previously had done finance, and we'd also declared finance sufficient. Did we? N no. Unless you did at the last meeting. I'm looking to Athena. I appreciate your confidence that I remember all these things off the top of my head. All right, we'll figure it out. Councilor, did, did I miss anything? I think we did. At the last meeting? Okay, right. excellent. Thank you. I mean, you know, my memory isn't always correct, but thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so, Kathy, you've already done JCPC, Jones Library, uh, Pam Rooney, and Paul. Thank you. Um, we have I've asked for a report on May 6th, so that's coming next meeting. Um, and obviously, as everyone is now aware, 
um, there's a big question mark. So that's going to be a very um, important conversation to have. Paul? Yeah, so I'll, I'll address this since it came up during public comment as well. I was going to talk about it at the town manager report, but this is a more appropriate time, I think. So the bid, we received one bid on Friday. It came in at two o'clock. Um, it's 18% higher than the last um, um, estimate by our two different estimating firms. Um, there aren't a lot of options. We can reduce the budget. We can increase revenue. Um, and um, and those are there aren't many options beyond that. Um, we have, you know, the, the um, owner's project manager and the architect uh, have been reviewing the budget along with uh, Bob Parent from our staff and evaluating what was the difference and why things are, are um, were so different than what our last estimate was. Um, but the bid is the bid. The numbers are, on, you know, are, are what they are. There's a limit to what we can do. Um, and, and so, um, the next step is to get as much information as possible. We have 30 days uh, to accept or reject the bids um, to meet with this, the uh, Jones Library Building Committee, have that conversation. That conversation will then extend to the town council. And I think that meeting will be probably not this week, but next week for sure, once they get all their um, analysis done of the bid. Um, look and look at different options available. if. Um, then it would the town council will have clearly have a discussion about it as will the Jones Library trustees. Um, I want to emphasize that um, the needs of that building have not disappeared. Uh, the HVAC, the roof, um, uh, other things with that building are very present and a concern. Um, I think that uh, we, you know, this is going to be one of those things where there are some things that we really want. Some many people really want to see happen, but we may have to have the fiscal discipline to say that say we can't do it unless we find another alternative. And that's what our mission is: is to see what are the alternatives available that for consideration by the council uh, and the in the building committee. But it's it's relatively new. We've had people have had basically the weekend and a day to really get dig into it. There's a lot of people we want to talk to in terms of. Um, um, doing the you know look as we look at bids and things like that and look at the the sort of market um, that generated this outcome. Are there any questions or comments? Okay, we're going to move on then to TSO. Andy. Yes, uh, I think that what we did in the past has been adequately reported and acted upon already at this meeting. Um, I just want to uh, get there for to the next steps. You heard from uh, Lynn at the beginning of the meeting that uh, we're going to follow up as um, on, on the Heatherstone Road. Um, and uh, there was a lot of public comment when it was for the committee. And uh, not only was there a lot of public comment from very involved and interested residents, but uh, it was uh, remarkable in that there was not consistency in the comments we received. And there were several that uh, people, uh, because of the time we were meeting, that anybody who was working in a normal job work hours or otherwise unavailable at that time, um, was not able to make public comment, so we had decided to hold a listening session, which will be on May 13th, and the th we have settled, I think, at 6.30, and it will be by Zoom um, and available. Um, it is going to be just a listening session, so we will not need to post it as uh, a council meeting, so anybody can attend the uh, reason for doing doing it and not having any deliberation that night is that we don't have to post it as a council meeting because uh, it, it sort of solves that problem. Um, so we have it on the agenda for then the next uh, several meetings. The two meetings that follow um, are May 16th and May 30th. And I just uh, will uh, mostly say that uh, 
the um, aside from starting the Heatherstone Road discussion, um, if there's a proposal that comes in regarding um, establishment of a transportation commission, which is something that we don't know, I know that it's been previously talked about. Um, we would uh, want to take that up in one of the next two meetings, and uh, we want to get into the waste hauler bylaw discussion. Um, the other thing that we're very interested in doing, because uh, you know that we were referred um, Henry Street and uh, Henry Street, well, it was an engineering report as far as what options uh, would be recommended for um, safety and for that section that in particular that involves the Cushman Scott Children's uh, Daycare Center. And uh, that um, we were told is going to be available to us. And uh, so we want to uh, get back to uh, Henry Street. And then the other thing we want to talk about is um, having a general discussion and uh, um, sort of begin to understand in relation to that and generally what are the options available to the council regarding um, establishing speed limits and traffic calming and other um, kinds of things of that nature and uh, that uh, the scheduling depends upon availability of the people that we would like to see uh, there we would like to see a superintendent mooring and um, engineer skills uh, from DPW if they are available. Uh, we would like to have, uh, and I can now call him this, Chief Ting or his designee uh, representing the police department and uh, the chair of Trans uh, Transportation Advisory Committee all participating in that. Uh, presentation and discussion with the committee so that we can begin to understand more fully what the options are that are available to the council. And uh, we're hoping that that will be May 30th, but I'm not going to say it with certainty because we have to make sure that the people who were I just mentioned uh, or their designees are available. So thank you. Pam Rooney, you have your hand up. Will this result in a an overall plan for traffic safety around town? This came up at JCPC um, last year, and it came up again with Cushman Scott traffic issues. Um, the idea is to get a plan for all the hot spots in town and get them addressed sort of as a comprehensive group and start hacking away at them. Thank you. Andy. And I think I don't really know there was, there's also the question about there are something that we've been alerted to I think the council issued that general law section 90 section 17c and what options um, are available to the council on the particular section so that is specifically listed in this uh, range of topics that we would like to have uh, and, uh, we, but I think we need to start a process, and uh, so uh, sort of in our priority of you know, things that need to be done in the first month uh, of the session, and uh, that's why um, it is part of it. It's a May discussion to begin the process, and hopefully to move in the direction. Yeah. Just talked about. Anna. I wanted to add to what Pam said. The other part of the conversation included uh, a process for uh, how we respond to those requests equitably and based on a plan of understanding where the hotspots are in town um, and realizing that there's only so far the safety zones legislation can take us and that we need something beyond that. So um, I'm looking forward to TSO tackling this. I know it's been something JCPC, but the council in general has wrestled with, and us as individual counselors have had to navigate a lot, is how to support people in our in our districts with areas of, of their 
community that they don't feel are safe to exist on because of the roads. So um, I appreciate TSO tackling this and look forward to seeing what comes out of it. Actually, I appreciate you bringing that up, Anna, because um, there's a uh, an additional piece that I should have mentioned, and that is that we wanted to have a presentation in a meeting with uh, the regarding um, the whole question of outreach. And um, when uh, you get into questions of outreach, then you get in, it sort of was raising a question that we've been talking about a little bit in the committee as to what we do as counselors when we receive uh, requests regarding conditions of roads, either because of um, either, uh, needing traffic calming or because of the condition of the road. Uh, and, uh, how, what is the appropriate, those responses. So that sort of is coming up as a part of either with this or through um, sort of what is meant by services outreach, what does outreach mean? And um, I guess the last thing I'll say is that we were very disappointed uh, that uh, Jennifer Morrison is uh, leaving and uh, sort of going back as a second of the three original CTOs that uh, is now leaving the town, leaving the town. Uh, remaining person who will be there uh, and uh, we simply couldn't have the meeting at the time. We wanted to have uh, Jennifer uh, uh, offer to come back to our meeting even though she will not be a town employee when we take up that issue and share her thoughts and experience and recommendations regarding uh, the whole range of outreach roles uh, that we need to talk about. Thank you. Uh, there's no minutes. We're going to move on to Paul. It's not a written report this time, but is there things you would like to highlight for us? Yeah, just a couple of things. First, I want to um, recognize the uh, terrific events that we've had recently. The sustainability fair was a great success a couple of weeks ago. Um, this weekend, many of you participated in the um, townwide cleanup where we had um, uh, rally points at Groff Park, at Mill River, and at Kendrick Park. We had a lot of people who showed up at the various locations and just thank you all and the members of the community that uh, filled up a dumpster uh, with, with trash and with uh, recycling. So thank you. Um, and then we had this yesterday, um, uh, we had the literacy fair on, on the common uh, and that was a really nicely done event as well. So those were good things and there's, it's just the beginning of the spring. So we have a lot more coming up. Um, the other thing is just to recognize uh, that you all are aware that uh, Fire Chief Tim Nelson has announced his retirement. Um, there probably will be a party for him as he leaves. Um, at some point, we were looking in at the towards the end of June, mid to late June for that. You'll um, and then we'll also be immediately embarking on that search. Now that we've got the police chief search completed, and uh, get that process going as well. So those are my updates. You'll have a, writ a full written report next week. Are there questions of the town manager? And Mandy Jo? Yes, um, I sent you an email, um, but I just want to bring it up here. The Cannabis Control Commission has now put out a draft model bylaw for its, um, its social host communities for, I think, the social equity business side. But you don't necessarily have to do the bylaw. There's three options. So I'm curious. Um, when you and town staff has decided which option you'll take, the bylaw, um, the a different by the model bylaw, a different bylaw, or a local approval process, uh, could you let the council know which that is so that we know whether a bylaw is coming to us for a review? I don't know whether there's a time limit on when we have to get in compliance with the social equity business portion of the state law. Yeah, so uh, we've always been out front asking to be a leader in the social equity piece of, of, 
of the marijuana legislation. We have a working group that includes planning, inspection services, uh, police, and health. Um, I think that's it. And they have not gathered together to to review this. Uh, we are, have been in touch with at least one of the um, operators in, in, in town. Uh, they reached out at the end of last week. So we'll be talking about what what how the laws, imp the new regulations impact their um, operations as well. So yeah, we're, we're looking at it. Um, Pam Rooney. Thank you. I had a question about the municipal aggregation. Could you give us an update on its status and are we celebrating? We should be celebrating. I, um, I, I believe the municipal aggregation was approved. Um, I'll get actually written uh, document to you on that uh, by the Department of Public Utilities. Um, so I think that 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 whole thing is moving forward, which is really good news. So will will there be a sort of an official response or acceptance of that? We do we? Yes, we we need to do that absolutely. Okay. The press release too, because it's a pretty press good release day. would be great. And yeah, so do we? We're we're in this with other towns. Are we the lead, or are we? Um, are we expected to pass the word along, or do they get notified as well? Oh, we're, we're in it with Northampton and Pelham, and they everybody everybody knows, is aware of where we are at this point. I'll see if I can get it. While you continue, I'll see if I can get more information on that. Northampton's the lead, isn't it? It is. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Ette? I usually prefer to know what I'm celebrating, and I wanted to know what municipal aggregation is that. So it's... Um, let's see. So it's the municipal aggregations where... The t where um, Instead of purchasing your electricity as the supplier from Ever EverSource, um, we will we will purchase it. The town will purchase it and have our priorities met in terms of how much of it is coming from the green and things like that. You can opt out, but it, the aggregation means that we, as a group, as a community, go in and buy our electricity together uh, from, uh, and we bid it out and do it that way. So, okay, Kathy Shane. Uh, I just wanted to uh, echo the praise of your staff, Paul, but on you talk about the cleanup. Angela was out there with a truck and stayed to be picking up. And I don't know how we did it, but up at Mill River, we had about 15 college students working with us. And I asked one, how did you know about it? And he said, I have no idea. We just all said we're going to go and do this this morning, <laughs> like, but it it was great because we actually had them crawling up and down these steep hills, um, and th it it was uh, celebratory. And I have three of the pickers in my car that we people stayed too late. The truck left, so I'm going to deliver them to her in her office because I don't know where else to bring them. <laughs> it it was it was it was a great event. I mean, um, she loved driving that truck. <laughs> She, she she's named it. She doesn't want to. She has a name for it, right? <laughs> um, but um, you know, Councilor Ryan f retrieved an, an an entire bicycle out of the river. It looked like I don't know where you got that. There's a car seat that another group found, and um, and she was able to drive that truck around and pick these things up. No, so. I got a bike wheel and a, a for wheel. sale yeah. sign for a house. So it was it was great. Small and large things. It was amazing. Yeah. And just that, back to the Valley Green Energy CCA. Uh, it was approved by the DPU on April 9th. Um, they are making some required minor adjustments to the contract for final submission, so it's not quite there yet. Um, but uh, and it, it looks like the program will launch in the fall. Okay. Are there any other questions of the town manager? Okay. Let me just begin my president's report, which is written and in your packet and seeking questions, but I also want to recognize that Representative Mindy Dom has been in the audience listening and continuing to advocate for us in many, many ways that we continue to seriously appreciate. Are there any questions from the President's report? Pam Rooney? Kathy? Okay. Remainder. Anna, did you have anything from your side? No, I was waiting, hopefully, to get a little bit further into the state budget process, and that uh, update came a bit too late for me to finalize the report, so hoping to have it for the next meeting. Okay. Um, we do have two meetings in, I'm just going on to future agenda items, we have two meetings in 
uh, May, and one of them will be on the 6th, and that is when the town manager will formally present the budget. We also have several things that we're going to have to try to juggle between the two. I want to really thank the committee, the council, for adding this extra meeting in April. It's allowed us to kind of mop up some things that got delayed, uh, but we still have a couple more. And so uh, we'll be balancing them back and forth between the two meetings that we have in uh, May. Uh, and also note that the Finance Committee has a really heavy burden in May for people who want to drop in and listen or whatever. Are there any other questions, comments? Yes, Councillor Haneke. I just want to say I'm concerned at the lateness that some documents have been coming in for our council meetings. Um, we didn't have any documents for the fire truck section mm -hmm. until mid after well afternoon today about noon. Um, a council committee report didn't come in till after one o'clock today or so. Um, and neither did some of the documents related to that agenda item. And I believe our rules say we're supposed to have everything sometime last week for a meeting on Monday. Right. And I know how hard it can be for committee chairs to get reports in in a timely manner, um, especially when meetings are late in the week, as I had to do for a number of years. I know how hard it is. But it's also extremely hard to be ready for a meeting when documents are coming in in the middle of the day of the meeting. And I think in the past, we had suggested that maybe those items get pulled from an agenda or be considered pulled from an agenda if they come in late. But I would just more encourage everyone to make sure documents are in well before Friday of the meeting of the week before the meeting. Thank you. I could not agree more. Are there any other comments? Seeing none, then I'm going to uh, make a motion and seek a second to adjourn the meeting. I move to adjourn. Is there a second? Shane seconds. I'm going to um, move to a roll call vote on that. Uh, and I'm going to start with Pam Rooney. Aye. Councilor Ryan. Aye. Kathy Shane. Yes. Andy Steinberg. Aye. Jennifer Taub. Yes. Uh, Anna Devlin Gothier. Aye. Councilor Ette. Aye. Lynn Griesmers. Aye. Councilor Haneke. Aye. Aye. Did I get everybody? Councilor Lord. Aye. It's nine. Um, I guess it's 10 in favor of adjourning. The meeting is adjourned. It is 829.